Thank you for choosing to listen to this message by our pastor, Brother Mike Beachy. Let us join now with the saints of God with open hearts and minds into a service already in progress. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. together. Did you enter the gates with thanksgiving? It's something in your heart is thankful this morning, ain't it? For the for the finished works of Calvary. Let's sing that course together. I don't know about you, but I'm excited this morning. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Praise the Lord. Just like Christmas time this morning. <clears throat> I will enter these gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I have entered these courts with his praise, and I will say this is the day that my Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice for Jesus. I have entered these gates with thanksgiving. yesterday and part in here just kind of touched my heart and I thought well I need to print it out and read it in church if I can so um, it says dear missionary Reverend Michael greeting in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to your family and all the saints that work with your precious outreach missionary work that God Jehovah has provided to you by his heavenly powers we had a very wonderful meeting last Sunday services we also had evening meetings at the Mua Church, and two people were so touched with the message preached, and they were baptized. The brethren of the Mua Church had time of remembering you and your ministries in prayers. Yes, you are spiritual father under your, um, you are spiritual father under your ministries, even you are, are far, but your ministries are, is going around the country of Malawi and the part of Mozambique. The message is reaching a lot of lost souls to come to our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless, Brother Tony.
We do worship that holy name. But there's no name given in heaven or in earth whereby men may be saved. But that name of Jesus, that wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we just lift up your holy name this morning, Father. Come and speak to our hearts, O oh Lord. and Open our minds and lift up our spirits. Enlighten us. Oh, Father, with the understanding of God, was the wisdom and understanding that comes from you, Lord. Not just an intellectual concept or reasoning, Father, but something that would be quickening into our spirit, change us from creatures of death to creatures of life. Lord, that we would be conformed to your image, to your glory. Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. 
It is a, a messy day. It's one of those days that it would be uh, much better to stay at home in the warm. But I'm glad we have the warmth here of the, of the house and trust of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I'm sure that the Lord will reward your efforts. Amen. And uh, thank you for Jim talk about going up there and Christian singing, and actually, uh, Christian had sent me a, we're going to finish embarrassing, we're going we're gonna to finish him off this morning, but uh, he had sent me actually here for a week or so ago, him and Tim was doing some stuff, really good, and, but I told him yesterday, I said, you've got a little something else in there, it's not all pike, it's not all pike, there, there's a bluegrass country hillbilly thing that he throws in there, that is not pike. That, that, that is something else. I'm not sure if that come from his mama's side or what, but there's something else got thrown in there that, uh, that wasn't Pike. But uh, he's, he's doing good. And uh, so anyhow, but it was kind of fun. We went up by for a few minutes yesterday ourselves, yesterday evening. And, and uh, But anyhow, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thinking about things that was being said this morning, uh, I had a real exciting, a real exciting topic to talk about this morning. I knew you'd be excited about it. It's death. <laughs> uh, I really did want to talk about death this morning, but the good thing about that is, is what goes with that, what comes after. And uh, I don't know, I there are so many scriptures, and uh, you go to looking at it, and that's why I brought my little pad with me to kind of help me. There's so many scriptures, I, I didn't write them down, and I, I normally don't. Uh, I, normally, I'll, I'll look at them, and, and I don't know if you say trust the memory or trust the Lord helps me. Most of the time, I, they come back, I can come back around to them, but... Sometimes there's, there's such a list, sometimes I get them confused. And, and so sometimes I'll bring something to help me kind of remember some of the scriptures. And, uh, but then sometimes it don't go that way anyhow. I don't get to that point or that far. But there's a lot of uh, scriptures that talks about this. And, and, uh, and then, you know, you'll hear ministers. And I heard a, a very good example the other day that was given uh, by Dr. Stanley, uh, talking about Jonathan and David and the covenant they had made amongst each other and how that led over to uh, Mesibetheth. I ain't saying that right, but anyhow, uh, Jonathan's son. And uh, it was a beautiful illustration that he brought out there. And, and uh, wow, that's, that's, that's nice. I like that, you know, so. Well, maybe, Lord, we can use that as a metaphor, and, and it's a beautiful illustration of what God has done for us. And, uh, but thinking of that there, you know, uh, Kenny was talking about some things, and, and you know, there's a, there's a dying part. There's a, as I said, sometimes we, we grab the outer shell, we grab the facade, we grab things that looks good a lot of times, but I believe it has to go deeper. And I think that's what's wrong with a lot in the church world today. We're not, you know, it's, we come in and all we preach about is the blessings of God and how they're just poured out upon us. And they are. There's truth in these things. But, you know, but then a person needs to be established in the Word. I talked to someone yesterday, said, you know, being brought up in religion and things. and But uh, talked about there being just so much confusion. And that is true. There is so much confusion because if you, no matter how many people you talk to, uh, just about everybody has a different view or a different version of the Word of God. they got their own mind, their own opinion, and, and what it means to them. And, and that's why we have to come back to the Word because uh, it's got to be more than just my take on it. It's got to be more than just what I think about it. It's got to be what the Spirit says. And that, that, to me, is the beautiful part about it. When the Spirit comes and begins to quicken and enlighten, 
And that's what brings life. And yes, it brings death. It kills out that outer man. But, you know, you learn that the more he dies, the more that Christ comes alive. And, uh, that, that is the part that just really gets quite uh, exciting, you know. When you realize that, you know, it's little simple things. Little simple things. Like the other day I uh, went to put on my coat. Maybe yesterday morning, I'm not sure. And uh, I've, I've, I've got a leather jacket that I bought. And I grabbed and put it on. And I thought, man, this thing is really heavy. And it is. It's a, if anyone has a leather coat or jacket, they're, 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 they're more weighty than just these other little synthetic things you buy, you know. And, and I grabbed that and put it on. But I thought, but it keeps me warm. It protects me. It, it works. And, you know, and I thought about that. Now, I put on a, another jacket I have Friday night, and it looks good, and it's pretty, but it don't keep me warm like that leather coat does. You know, it, 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 it helps some, and, and it does, but, and it's light, you know. It, it's easy to wear. And just thinking about that, and then the thought came. Well, that's the way the cross of the Lord is. It ain't always the lightest, it ain't always maybe the prettiest, but it does the job. It keeps you warm, it brings you shelter, it, 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 it you know, protects you. And uh, so just, you know, it's just amazing how the Lord will, will bring just little simple things to help you with your walk. And uh, so it's just uh, wonderful. I'm not thinking about these things, and, and uh, I was thinking about what Brother Jim said about the body wearing out. It does seem that the older you get, things happen. But, uh, you know, Brother George preached to us that the body wasn't made to wear out. You know? He said, you know, the, even the heart, man has never made a pump that works like the heart. You know, and, and, and you know, he just didn't believe that this body was made to wear out. And evidently, it wasn't in the, the originality. It must not have been because there again, we could go back and there's a lot of talk and this could maybe open up. You know, somebody says a can of worms, but how long was Adam and Eve in the garden? I don't know that anybody knows, do we? And it also speaks in the millennium that we would live a thousand years and, and a child would be a hundred. That would be just a child. They'd be just getting started, you know? So evidently the body is made. God ordained it originally. So well, what are these things? What are the cataracts? And what are these things that happen in our joints? And that's the curse of sin. That's the curse of sin. So how do we get rid of it? Remove the curse. Remove the curse. Remove sin. The curse is lifted. And what does that mean? It means we're eternal creatures. Eternal creatures. You know? And so, you know, sometimes I think we get focused too much maybe on the here and now and and, you know, we want this bodily change. The problem is a lot of times we're, we're getting older and we don't want to admit it or, or we'd like to keep that youth. We want to keep the fires burning, you know. And, you know, there's a part of us that God's trying to kill out. Because first comes that thought and then comes the desire and then comes lust and then it comes sin and then comes death. So there's a... Part, there's an element there that God's trying to kill out to do away with so that we can overcome the flesh. You know, so, you know, there's, there's a, a, a lot that's happening and uh, I believe the Lord wants to help us, amen? He made us, got to remember, we were, were made in the image, in the reflection, in the image of God. So I don't think he made that 
to perish. He didn't come and make an image that was in his image so it could shrivel. How could it be in his image, in his likeness, if it was made to die? It couldn't have been. A lot of people, they, they say, you know, well, remember, we're, we're in the image of God. No, we were in the image of God. We're in the image of God if we've received his spirit and come back into the place he meant for us to be. But not in this cursed condition. That's not the image of God. No, because it's without. Amen. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to think that God has, but he's, he, he's, he's went so far. He reached so far to, to, to have mercy upon us and to bring us back. And uh, maybe we just look at some of this and we may need to do just a little bit of reading. And, and, but maybe just ask the Lord to help us that, you know, sometimes uh, maybe teachers and and people that are giving speeches or making presentations, you know, maybe something is, is, is clear in their mind. Sometimes we do. Something is just, you know, and sometimes, but in ministry, sometimes it's not always clear in our mind. Sometimes we still have a question in there, and we're depending on the Holy Spirit to come and make that clear. To, you know, a teacher comes up and begins to teach you math and algebra and these different things, and they already have the formula. They, they, they see that. They see that picture. There's a mind picture. It's, it's kind of like playing music. You know, uh, you can take like Thomas, you can set him down and you can start playing. He can just about sit down with the guitar with just about anybody, and, and he just picks it up. You know, and, and the Lord's helped me. I can usually follow on the bass, especially if I, if I know the songs, if I've heard it. If I've heard it before, you know, somebody's got a new one, hey, sing a verse, you know. You just, there's something in your mind that you just hear that. You, you just, it, it's interwoven and you hear that and you just, it's like it automatically, you know where it's going. You know, once you learn that pattern, you kind of learn where it's going. And, and so in, in teaching, you know, the, the teacher, they know the formula, they know how it works. And once you know the formula, it's just like learning your, your ABCs or 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 learning two plus two and, and three plus three and, the, 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 and then your times tables. Once you learn the formula, then it doesn't matter what the numbers are because there's something that automatically works those numbers. You know how to get your answer. I used to know some of that. Now, what little bit I did learn, I, I forgot some of it, but sometimes some of those things get kind of dull. You don't use them every day. I used to enjoy math, you know. Uh, I didn't get very far in it, you know, but... Uh, I, what, what I did have, I enjoyed it. And, uh, but, you know, but when you know how to work the formula, and that's what, that's what Brother George was trying to get across to us. A lot of times you'd hear him, and he'd be repeating, he'd be repeating, he'd be repeating, and, and he'd be breaking it down. That there's a one, two, three. There's a body, soul, spirit. There's, a, there's the earth, you know, the first heaven, second heaven, the third heaven, there's the natural, the physical, the spirit. He was trying to build a formula. And, and once we got that formula, then it didn't matter what you looked at. That's why he could look at anything and bring types and shadows of revelation because he learned the formula how that God broke things down. We know that God works in threes. We know he works in sevens. He works, you know, with numbers and things. And you see these things represent. And you learn that. So... All the way from Genesis to Revelation, you see that God had a pattern. And when you get that pattern, you get the formula. Then you can, it didn't matter what the numbers were. All of a sudden, you can, you can come up with the answer. And, and, and so that's what we want. Because we can know, we can hear, we can hear the answer. But if we don't get the formula, if we don't get the formula, if we don't get what is making that happen, and that's what's important. And that's what he was trying to get across to. And that's what I want. You know, so that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we come and we know that there's a, a as you might say, a problem on the board. We know that there's numbers or we know that there's a, a subject. We know that there's something there. And we know part of it. But we want to find out what the rest of that formula is. And that's where we have to depend upon the Holy Spirit to come. And he begins to break that down. And he began, because we read the scriptures, we read over, over and over and over. And that's how that, 
you know, it was talking to somebody, you know, that's what happens a lot of times. That's how, why we have so many different denominations. We get a, a, a truth, and they'll get a truth. It'll be a truth. And then and they'll start out on that, and, and then they'll build around that one truth. They got a truth, but they, 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 we end up stopping there. When there's so much more to building this house than, than just the foundation. The foundation's good. We got to have it. We need it. Uh, just like coming down the road down here and they're building another house. And, you know, I was thinking about that. And you look at it and, well, they've got it framed up and they got plyboard around it, you know. And so then you get, they got the structure there. But then what is the outside of that house going to finish out to be? Now, they can go and... No doubt it will be very nice, but, you know, they could go and you've got the square footage, you've got the structure. They could go and just put vinyl siding on there. Well, for most of us here in the South, we kind of look at that as kind of, you know, that's it's kind of going on the cheap side, you know? You know, got a big, nice house like this, why would you put vinyl siding, you know? But then, but it would still be the same house. It's still got the same square footage. You might walk in and they might have crown mold in every room and in the closets and bathrooms. I mean, it might just be, but you look at that. Or then they'll take that and then they'll put, maybe they'll put nice siding, hardy plank. Maybe they'll put brick. Then they'll put some stone and then they add some things, you know. So now all of a sudden you look at it and they don't look at, oh, that's a cheap house. We look at it, wow, look at that. That is nice craftsman looking house. That's nice, you know. So... You can take and just do a basic, or we can dig into this thing and realize, wait a minute, God has something more for us. You know, he can really dress this thing up very nice if we'll let it. And there, there, so that, that's a part of that change, I believe, that is taking place. You know, we've been taught, everybody's waiting for a rapture, but we've been taught there's a change that's taking place. We're being changed from glory to glory. Glory to glory. And that's the beautiful thing. So it, there's got to be a change in here, in our heart, in the inner being, if there's going to be what we call a rapture. That is just the last of it. That, you know, everybody's waiting for that there, but that, that's just the consummation of the thing. You know, we're, we're progressing toward that, and that's what's going to help bring this is when we understand what's on the inside. You know, what's on the inside? You know, it's like the house. See, we can look at the outside, and just like I said, we might put vinyl on it and then really make the inside. But then on the other hand, it might make the outside look nice and go inside and there's nothing there, you know? So let, let's get on the inside and see what God really has. And that, that's our goal, and that's what we'd like to do. So maybe we can just... Talk about this a little bit and just see if the Lord would come and, 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 uh, and just speak to us a little bit and, and see if, and just help us to, that we can understand some things more, you know, and, and, and make it clear. Make it clear to our hearts and to our spirit and to our mind. And because uh, I know how it is. Sometimes, you know, you may be places, someone will ask you a question. You know, sometimes you just draw a blank. It's like, you hate to say I don't know because you do know, but then again, at that moment, you don't know. You know, it's like, okay, where's it at, Lord? You know, help me. You know, I don't know if you've been in that situation. I have many a time. <clears throat> now, let's just begin over in Romans chapter 5. Like I say, I believe all of this ties in together as this, as what God has done. Brother Jim, I want to mention how that we've been perfected, we've been sanctified, we've been, you know, glorified. And here again, I say so many times, all these things is through Christ Jesus. It's not me, me, me. It's not the me, me bird. There's a there's a country song they have out there that says the same thing. You know, it's about me. You know, we don't sing enough about you. We're going to sing about me, you know. And uh, 
But I'm glad it's all about him. And everything that I am is because of him and it's in him. And when you begin to realize the mercy and grace of God, you realize that. You realize that, you know, this wasn't something that I'd done. It wasn't something that I merited. It was because of what Jesus Christ has done. His mercy and his grace. And so that's what makes it so beautiful is that this is what he has done for me. Because he keeps his word. He made a covenant with us. And he keeps his covenant. Amen. I'm glad he keeps his covenant. So he says here, and we may need to read, uh, we may just need to read several chapters here. We may need to read the book of Romans. We may just need to read the whole New Testament. I don't know. We got a few minutes. <laughs> I think we could do, no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Start saying we could do this maybe in about five minutes, but that, that's not going to happen. Uh, it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Hallelujah. If the devil is tormenting your mind, don't look at this scripture. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith. How do we have that justification? Well, let's just start back right here just a moment. Let's go back over here to St. John chapter 5. Hold the place in Romans. Because, you know, the devil sometimes wants us to think that all these things of God and it's going to be somewhere out there in the future somewhere. One of these days. One of these days. Well, I got news for you. Today is that one of those days. Today is the day that the Lord has... You know, and, and to get it to register, you hear Brother Pike and you listen to messages and it'll go over and over. And like I said, he'll repeat things. And, I, 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 you know, I'm up here on the roof, you know, and, and working and, and I'm listening to this. I'm thinking... What does the Son, and I've heard this so many times, I'm like, but what does the Son going up and going down, going up and going down as we call it, you know, just making its rotation or the earth rotating, you know, what does that have to do with anything? I mean, what does that have to do with anything? Other than that man began to count. One day, two day, three day, four day. Now I'm a year old. And now I'm 10. And now I'm 50. But what does that have to do with anything? Just because the galaxies and, and the earth is rotating around the sun and these things, what does that have to do with anything? Do I got it right? Which one's rotating around what? <laughs> Show my education. But I mean, what does that? It goes up, it comes down, it goes up. Day one, day two. What's that got to do with anything? I mean, when you stop to think about it, it's like, what does it have to do with anything? You know, in time, should be no more. Maybe we just need to quit counting. It wouldn't have quick out. But Jesus, he says, oh, maybe I just need to start back up here to verse 19. Chapter 5, St. John. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, so even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. He makes 
us alive. He came that we would have life and have it more abundant. I love to hear Brother George talk about that. Filled up and overflowing. He, he, did, he don't just come and give us the breath of life. He don't just come and give us a little thimbleful. He said he would have us to have it more abundant. Running over. Run over. Whom the, fa- the Father quickened, whom he will, and he even gave the Son that he could do the same thing. He quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. He gave the judgment to the Son. What did the Son do? Neither do I condemn thee. What did the Son do? You know, you know, he took away our sin. He took away our sin. If he took away our sin and the penalty of death is sin or the penalty of sin is death, then where are we at? He said he committed the judgment to the son that all men should honor the son even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son honoreth not the father which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. I mean, we can close the book and go home and, 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 and rejoice. This is Jesus talking. He's speaking to us. Is what he said true or not? He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. That was another one. I was... So, how wonderful is this? Jesus came and he he paid this here for us. Jesus says in John 8, 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my sayings, he shall never see Death. Again, what did he come for? Do we believe it? You know? Or we believe in what he said? So, we go back to Romans chapter 5. Now, we didn't get past the first verse yet, did we? Therefore, being justified by faith. See, what faith are we justified? And we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're justified by his faith. He he had all judgment given into his hands, and he believed that he could make the sacrifice, that he could go and be the perpetuation for our sins, and as the song says, that I could still go free. He, He paid it so I could go free. So we're justified by his faith. That's what we need to remember. It's not by my faith. It's by his faith. His faith. His faith don't fail. That's why Paul said, the life I now live, I live according to the faith of the Son of God. If I live according to my faith, well, you know what? I'm going to have some good days and I'm going to have some bad days. One day you may see me and I'm I'm shouting the victory and, and man, we're, we're, we're just... On the mountaintop. But then the next day, you may say, how's how's it going, brother? Well, you know, I had a crash landing last night. 
I was flying high, you know. What was it? Big bird come by and swooped down, got the parrot, and flying over the, over to everybody, you know. He's flying high, boys, flying high. He was the beak, he was in the beak of the predator, you know. He's flying high. I don't want to be flying high like that. That's coming to a bad end. But it's not have to be that way. See, that's why we put our faith in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're dependent upon him. He did the works. He finished it. That, that's, that's what was so beautiful about that story. Because, uh, maybe we won't read that, but David, he made a covenant with Jonathan. And they made a covenant together that they would hold this covenant to their extended families. So when Jonathan was killed, Saul and Jonathan, know, and David became king, he sent. There was this young kid that was Jonathan's son that had gotten crippled day when they was fleeing because of this here. Uh, that the nurse dropped him in or he fell and he, he got crippled in his feet. And here he was, he was afraid. Because he'd been told, you know, when a new king comes in, what's he do? He wipes out the family of the previous. He, he wipes out any, any chance of anyone uprising, questioning, and call, bringing into jeopardy, they do wipe them out. So he was living in fear that David at some point was going to catch up with him. And David finally did, and he sent for him. And he's in fear for his life, and he comes, and he falls, and he, he humbles himself before David. And David says, fear not. This is what Dr. Stanley was bringing out. It was beautiful. But David said, fear not. I've made a covenant with your father. And I'm going to keep my word. And you know what? Everything that was your father's, even to your grandfather, I'm going to restore all that land back to you. I'm going to give that to you. They're going to take care of that. You got servants. They're going to take care of you. They're going to reap the harvest. They're going to bring you. And you're going to have all this here to you for your benefit, for your income, for your wealth. And then all on that, you're going to eat at my table. Why? Because I made a covenant with your father. This son didn't do anything to deserve this. He, didn't, he, he wasn't one way or the other. He just got caught in the mix of this and he seen kindness because of the covenant. That is the same thing God has done for us. He brought us in and you know what he's done? He is restoring back what was taken from us. You know, even our original father that we fell from, what did he do? He put man in charge of all of this. He fell, it came into the hands of Satan, but God is saying, I'm going to give it back to you, all your lands and stuff. I'm giving it back to you. Amen. Was it because we made a covenant? No, because God made a covenant. God made a promise. He made the promise, so we reap the benefits. So we see that, wow, that's why Therefore, being justified by faith. Oh, yes. Just believe it. Say, well, I thought he did. I didn't think we had to do anything. But how can you reap the benefit if you don't believe it? I mean, your, your, your parents, your, your uncle or a grandparent or somebody might leave you a million dollars. But if you don't believe it, if you don't act on it, you never receive it. You never receive it. That's why James said, you know, you, you say, but I got faith. He said, well, show me your faith by your works. You know? You say you got faith? Well, show me. He said, I'll show you my faith by more. What does he mean? And people get that confused. Well, we're working to salvation. No, you're not working to salvation. You're working because of salvation. You're working because why? What happened? Faith. Look at it this way. Take, man's out here, and he, maybe he's working for a company. You know, and, and he tells, you know, one of these days, one of these days, I'm, 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 I'm going to become a millionaire. And maybe he's working at McDonald's for minimum wage. One of these days, I, I, one of these days it's going to be my McDonald's. But you know what? If he never does anything different, 
He keeps coming in and he's doing the same thing. 15 years from now, he's still down there at a janitor or whatever, working for minimum wage. It's just something he's talking. But then there's someone else that says, you know what? I'm going to own this McDonald's. And they begin to learn what makes that company tick. They learn what makes that company operate. You know, they find out, working at that company, what, what is for the betterment of this company? You see people like this. There, there, there's people on both sides. There's people that come in, they punch a clock. They don't want to hear nothing about it. They come in to do their eight hours and eight or ten hours, they're going home. They don't want to hear nothing else about it. Somebody's boss says, hey, you know, guys, man, we got this push order. We need somebody to stay over 45 minutes. Man, I ain't staying. I'm going home. It don't mean nothing to me. Somebody else steps in and says, you know what? Hey, man, I'll, I'll take care of it. What happens? One person, you know, he, he might talk about he's going to be a millionaire one day, but you know what? He's still doing the same thing. But that other person, he finds out what makes this company operate. What makes it tick? You know, and he begins to apply himself. Next thing you know, what's he do? If he can't do it in that company, he steps out and he starts his own company. Why? Because there's something in him that drives him. And you know what? He becomes that millionaire. He becomes that a person that succeeds. What is it that they're doing? That is what James is talking about. Show me your faith by what you do. Don't just talk about it. Amen. Don't just talk about being a Christian. Don't just talk about going to heaven. Let me see what you're doing about it. Amen. Your life talks to me. Amen. So he's saying, you know, let's don't just boast. Let's be doers. Not hearers only, but do. That's faith. Faith is action. Faith is that. Faith ain't just talking. Faith ain't just feeling good. Faith ain't just some exuberant. Faith is action. Sometimes the people that we think have the least amount of faith have the most. They might not be saying a whole lot. But then you see their actions. I can think of my dad. Maybe a lot of times you didn't hear a whole lot. Now later on, he got to where he talked pretty good. If you got cornered up or he got, got a chance, he, he would talk to you. But, you know, a lot of times while people was, maybe it looked like they was getting into revelation. Maybe it looked like they were soaking it up. Boy, they were sitting right there with Brother George. And Brother Atlee would be working. He would be getting things done. He'd be working. But you know what? When he did stop and when he did sit down, it went down deep. And you know what? It was with him till the day he took his last breath. Brother, one of them was saying a while ago, when the hospice nurses came in, he was testifying to them. He was telling them, hey, y'all need to go help somebody that needs some help. I ain't going to need no help getting out of here. I've got all the help I need. Amen, because everything had been put in order. See, faith. So therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Ain't it wonderful to have peace living in a chaotic world that we live in? I mean, think about that. I mean, that's something you, you can't put no monetary value on. Think about having peace living in the world that we live in. I mean, there's confusion, turmoil, just constantly everywhere. It's, you know, it's in the world around. It's in the church. It's in people's minds. It's in their heart. Why? The Bible says, commit your works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. People's thoughts are established because they're not committing their works to God. And we got... What? The Google God and internet and the web? Let's think of the internet, web, all these other things that are just constantly just putting junk, garbage, junk, garbage, junk, garbage into our minds, just keeping us busy, and we can't even focus. Just continually, just stuff, 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 stuff. That's why we know, hey, Sometimes we need to hit the delete button. Ching, ching, you know, time to go. Peace.
speaks. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We're standing in this grace. What is it? Just like that prodigal son. Just like that prodigal son that his father accepted back. That's what we've seen in that story there when David accepted this here son of Jonathan. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. We glory in tribulations. Why? Jesus said they were going to come. He said, you're going to be delivered up. He said, they're going to do the, he said, if they're doing it to me, they're going to do it to you. What did he say? Take up your cross and follow me daily. That's what Jesus told him. He didn't say, take up your blessings. Take up your cross. This is the side of the gospel we want to leave off. What was my quote earlier? They that are godly shall suffer persecution. If we're not suffering persecution, we might not be being godly. They that are godly shall suffer persecution. So now some, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And when we are yet, when we were yet, Without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure, for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't even seeking him. We were doing our own thing. And yet he still died for us. We weren't worthy, but yet he died for us. We were made worthy through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what's so beautiful. We're made worthy through him. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath, from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Have we received it? See, there again, we testify of one thing, but a lot of times we live something else. Go back and look at what our testimony is. What the Word of God says. The same Brother Pike was saying about even in the preliminaries, talking about, you know, we come to hear the Word of God. It's the Word of life. And either we believe it or we don't. I know sometimes we struggle with it. We, you know, we, sometimes we need to be honest about that. Sometimes we want to put on this picture that, oh, man, we're the one of faith. We, you know, sometimes we struggle with things. Recognize that and face it. Ask God to help us. That's why the understanding and the comprehension, it's not, it, it's more, as we've been taught, more than just, well, you just, just believe it. But, you know, to really believe and really put your faith into something, there has to come some understanding. The more you understand it, the more you believe it. That's what's so beautiful. The more God reveals himself, the more you believe in God. You know, you're certain that God is. Amen? The Bible says when we come to him, we must believe that he is, that he exists, that he is, 
and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we've got to confirm in our heart, God is. He is exactly what he said he is. He's God. He's God. And then you begin to realize what that God has done for you and I. That's what's beautiful. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned at the, the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. There was a sin. There was a death penalty that got placed. And it was passed down. That was what was in our genes. That was what was in our DNA that was passed down because of the fall. But praise be to God. That's what Jesus came for. Amen? To take, take care of that. Nevertheless, death reigned through Moses, from Adam to Moses, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offense unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of the grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Everything comes back to him. And all things were made by him and for him, and, and, and for him were they created. And so everything comes back to him. And that's why the judgment was given to him. And what was the judgment that he gave us? He judged us righteously, didn't he? He said, you know what? For your sin, I'm going to give you life. You give me your life. You give me your sin. That penalty of death, I'm going to take that. And I'm going to take it upon me. And I'm going to take it to Calvary. And I'm going to give you life in transfer. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. How great is that? We can become the righteousness of God. Us, poor, helpless, sinners. Going out from the presence of God. Done our own thing. And he took our life that we could take his. Therefore, as by the offense... One judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. For how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How do we continue? I mean, go over there at Hill Haven and see how many people over there sinning. How do we continue in sin if we're dead? How do we do that? There's a nature. There's something that's been done away with. 
There's something that's dying so that something else can live. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He he that is dead lives. (laughs) It's so so wonderful. God just, he he just comes and he just turns everything upside down. That's why I said, that the things of God cannot be understood by the carnal mind. It can't comprehend it. It can't receive it. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall have, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servant ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even now yield yourselves members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in these things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. But now we've been born again. He's come to do away with the sin. So the wages of sin is death. If I'm not sinning, then I don't get that wage anymore, do I? I, I'm not still going to that same place of work. I'm not checking that time clock no more. I'm not punching that time clock. No, I've changed my job. I've changed where I'm looking to. I've changed, and it goes on to talk about that woman that was bound to that first husband, which was of the flesh, but that's been done away with. But she's bound as long as he's alive, but Jesus came to what? To do away with that. We may just have to read some more. We think of Jesus and and his death, and what does that mean for us? (laughs) 
There's a verse in Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. If he tasted death for every man, then why do we have to continue to taste of it? It's kind of like what said there, Jesus told him, said, fear not. For I have overcome the world. Why is he telling me not to fear if he's overcome the world? Because he's overcome the world for me. Why is he saying here? He said he tasted death for every man. He tasted death for me. So death has been eradicated for us. He's been made the captain of our salvation. Amen. What is that death? Just interject a couple more verses here. Think about that there. In Isaiah, that to me is the beautiful part about this because this isn't just New Testament doctrine. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It goes back to the Old Testament. You see, because Isaiah 28, 15 said, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death. And with hell, are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies a refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. He's saying, you know, we've made a, a, a league. We've got so accustomed to this thing of death that we just accepted it. He's saying, we don't have to accept it. Let's break this covenant. That we had with death. What he's saying in, in, in chapter 9 of Isaiah, verse 2 the people that walked in darkness, David say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. Paul turned my people from darkness to light. To what understanding? To the light of God, that they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon have seen the great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined. This light of God has shined upon our hearts. We've been given something. And it's more than the wages of sin. We've been given the gift of eternal life. And as many as is here and believe has passed from death unto life. You become eternal creatures. But you know, when you tell people that, you know, what, what do you mean you're eternal? Well, how could you not be eternal? I mean, if I'm born of the Spirit of God, How much spirit of God? What part of the spirit of God is not eternal? I mean, if if you could measure it, if you just only have a a thimbleful, is that not eternal life? It's eternal. So let's just go back to Romans. I just want to continue on here just a moment. There's just some other scriptures that I like throwing in there every now and then because they they kind of work in the mix here. But it says, if we go on, go on into chapter 7, know ye not, brethren. Because there's some verses that I've run across that I'm not sure exactly where they're at. Maybe we'll come across them here. So I'm just going to read. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. We know that sin got its strength from the law. Not that the law was bad, but Satan taking occasion. See, what did he do? That's how he held the children hostage. Wait a minute, God, you got a law, and you know what? He transgressed, so he's got to pay. He's got to pay. He's got to pay. 
That's why it said death reigned from Adam to Moses. See, we would think, well, why didn't it say from Adam to Jesus? But it was Adam to Moses because that was the shadow, that was the covering they had till Jesus came, was Moses. He said, Moses, we know. We got the law, we got these things. <laughs> Jesus, we don't know about you now. They didn't accept him. They had Moses. The death reigned from Adam to Moses. And sin got its strength by the law. Satan, the accuser, what is he doing? Oh, wait a minute, God, you got a law here. It said, you know, he should, and you, thou shalt not do it. They did it. He's got to pay the penalty. Always pointing the finger. Always accusing. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's why he made a new covenant. That's why that first was broken, because in the flesh we couldn't keep that. That's why he come to give us the Holy Spirit. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit is the one that wrote the covenant. So the Holy Spirit can keep that covenant. Amen. He keeps that covenant, see? And then when we do stumble, when we do fail, you know what? He is there to pick us up. He is the propitiation. He is there to say, huh, no, we're not putting that. Because he was doing his best to serve me and to follow me. That's my child. No, Satan. When Satan points now, what's he say? He has to point now. Well, all I see is the blood of Jesus Christ. All I see is members of the body of Christ. All I see is perfection. All I see is a sinless body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see their faults. I don't see that. He said, as long know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. This is why we reckon ourselves to be dead, ain't it? We died. I'm not stopping up there at the graveyard giving anybody no tickets for breaking the law. I'm not writing them up. Nothing's happening. Which of course, nowadays, if they could figure out a way to do it, they probably would. <laughs> for the woman, remember, the woman, the flesh, the body, for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married unto another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Jesus came and fulfilled that law. He folded up that law. He laid it away. He's saying, you're not bound to Moses any longer. I'm bringing in a new covenant. That one was unto death. This one's unto life. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another, even to him which is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's what we were of. Everything we did brought death. It didn't matter what we did. It brought death. Man is trying his best to figure out how to prolong life. They have the medical world. You have others that are seeking out uh, natural remedies. There are things that we can do to prolong. But the problem is we've got to get rid of the curse. We've got to get rid of the curse. This in, these things inflicted on our body is from the curse. And I'm here to say Jesus come to do away with that curse. He came to lift that curse.
Back to verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now, but now, just as John said about sin, who that said he hath not sinned is, makes him a liar. But God is faithful to forgive him. And then if he says he hadn't sinned, you see before, you see Calvary, and you see after Calvary. You see the difference. Now, we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For the sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just and good. Was then that which is good made death in me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin working death in me, that that which is good, that sin by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul oh, recognize, wait just a minute, let's put this in perspective and realize God, yes, magnified it. We heard the preacher come. He preached by the foolishness of preaching that men might be saved. He said, you know what? You need to repent of your sins. You was born in sin, shaping in iniquity. You need a Savior. Something happens. It convicts our heart. We're grieved on the inside. It, can, it brings conviction. So we do like they did on that panel. Well, what must we do? He said, repent. What? Now the change can take place. What do God uses the law to magnify the sin, to bring us under conviction so that we repent, so that we can become sinless, so that we can become one of his. That old man, that first husband done away with, for the law is spiritual. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but it is sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil that which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but a sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And a lot of people get hung up right there. Why? Because they want an excuse. But I'm telling you, this is not what Paul was talking about. I wasn't headed to church and I just couldn't help myself. I had to stop at the ballroom and get drunk. I was headed to church, but I passed that brothel and I just couldn't help myself. That is not what Paul was talking about. He said, when I would do good, evil is present. He was talking about there's a continual warfare in my mind. Yes, Satan is continually coming, but you know what? I'm continually casting down. But listen to what Paul goes on to say. If you don't think Paul had the victory, just listen to what he says. Listen to his message. Paul wasn't given a message of excuses. No. No. Because, well, we'll go ahead. We'll just read a little bit. Let's let Paul talk to us. 
Because we look at that. For I would do good. Evil is present. Okay? I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There's a spiritual warfare that's taking place. I thank God. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how he's going to deliver me. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And I say, oh, I see there. I go to church on Sunday and, and, but then what's he say? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I said, exactly. I'm no longer condemning myself for the thing that I allow. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not condemning myself oh, because all said it's there. I would do good. He was present. I, that, was, that was the members of the flesh. But in my mind, my spirit, I'm still serving God. Shall we continue in sin because grace abounds? God forbid. See, what is sin? It's not the things you do. It is a nature. Sin is a nature. So it's unbelief, and I believe. <laughs> it is unbelief. It is the nature of unbelief. Because when you believe, how do we believe and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ without him coming into our heart and our lives? And we reckon that old man to be dead. Reckon him to be dead, don't we? Crucified with Christ. So that, that new man comes alive. There's a new man. So there is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there must be something that I can do here. Because the Bible, I can go on over in Paul's writings and make it very clear that adulterers and idolaters and drunkenness and drunkards and lasciviousness and these other things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So I guess maybe there's a part of you that's going to heaven and there's a part of you that's going to hell. I know some people believe God's going to save them in spite of themselves. For the law, he said, those, they walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Some people feel that I've been freed from the law. It has no bounds on me. So the thou shalt nots don't apply. Well, even in the natural, it'll get you in trouble. Even people that ain't serving God, there are certain morals, there are certain thing, instinctions that God has placed in man. We know that there's things you should not do. We just inherently know that. You just know that. There's some things you know. You, you know you don't go over and steal your neighbor's chickens. You don't go steal his wife. You don't go just take his car. You don't abuse his children. There's things you know. Nobody has to tell you. You know that. You don't do that. For the law of the spirit of 
of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Some people, we're just calling them Christians. Don't make us go preach that sermon. I think the way it works. He says here, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that hath, he hath raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren... We are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, mortify, that is to put to death, the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's taking up your cross and following Him. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy of, to be compared with the glory that which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation, expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who hath, who hath hope subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God, the creature itself. I believe that's where Paul is touching on. Even the body, there's going to be a change. This mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruptible is going to put on incorruption. There is a, a, a part there that even as what we see, even as to the natural, as what we, as the Lord called sleep, it's coming to a point we're going to pi- bypass that. That's what he said when he stood there at the tomb of Lazarus. You know, I, I, don't you love that? They, they, they said, Lazarus is sick. Let, let's go. And Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. Well, we thought, well, he lied. Jesus, Lazarus died. Yeah, but he resurrected. Yeah, but he died. No, he didn't die. This sickness is not unto death, but unto the glory of God. I'm telling you, the life that you're living is not unto death, but for the glory of God. That's the beauty of it. I promise I'm going to quit here pretty soon. We ain't ain't got too many more pages. (laughs) I'll try to finish up. He said, but, the, but it's going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I, I just believe that there was something that Brother Pike was trying to get across. And I, I'm saying, Lord, help us to find that key. And help us to comprehend. Help us to believe. Help us to get a hold of it because there's something here that has to do with even the change of the body. 
We got, we got to recognize that change in the spirit and that there's no death there before we can get to the bodily part. And I believe the body has to conform to the spirit. And that's what we're looking forward to, ain't it? That's why we're subjecting ourselves to the mind of Christ because the mind of Christ is life. For we know that the whole creation grown and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even our, our, ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we shall pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against it? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is it? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sore. As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at what he has done for us. And if David, showing God's mercy, can keep a covenant which was made between two people, two people, and can keep his word, how much more will our Heavenly Father keep his word to them that love him? How much more? Amen. Can we stand together? That's why he says here, Romans 4 and 6 says, even as David also, here David, back in the Old Testament, even David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So we know that if the wages of sin is death, sin got its strength to the law. Jesus came and he fulfilled all of that. And that's been done away with. That's been eradicated. How could there be any death? How could there be any death? And Jesus said, they that believe in the words that I say shall never die. Shall never see death. We can never see death. Never. Paul's trying to bring that on over. That there's also going to be those that are not going to sleep. There's going to be those that they're, they're not going to succumb to even to the graveyard. They're not going to lay that body down. No, it ties in to what Jesus Christ has done. And when he hung there at Calvary and he, he said, it is finished. It was finished. The work had been complete. 
Man had been set free. Man had been set free. Why didn't it just happen then? Because God gave us a window that you and I could come in. Because we were on the outside. We were the Gentile. We were those that was in darkness. See, they had the light of Moses. They had those things. Even though they didn't believe, they, they acted like they did, but they didn't. The thing is, God gave a window. He gave a window of grace that you and I, even as the Gentiles or those that were on the outside, would have an opportunity that this light of God would come in and eradicate the darkness in our life. Eradicate it and bring light. So it's wonderful that we know that we died. Now we can live. They said, well, it's appointed unto man once to die. I know. And we died. We died. That was the whole thing. We died. I died. You know? We realized, you no, know, that was my body hanging there at Calvary. <clears throat> that was my body hanging there at Calvary. It died. Penalty of sin was death. It died. But it's alive forevermore now. It's alive forevermore because there's been a resurrection from the dead. What a wonderful thing. What glorious thing the Lord has done. How marvelous it is in our eyes. Amen. Brother Kenny mentioned a song earlier, and I thought he was going to sing it, and then he didn't. Page 16. Oh, I want to see him. I trust it. You've invited the Lord Jesus into your life. Made him Lord of your life. Some people want him to be Savior. They don't want him to be their Lord. He needs to be our Lord and Savior. And I trust something has been said to at least help provoke some thoughts. Help us Come a little closer to seeing that death has been eradicated. And we're alive forevermore. Jesus Christ. You know, if we, I guess the Lord has to give it to us, you know, in stages, a little bit alone, because if He just dumped it all on us one time, I, you know, there wouldn't be no body left. It would be a change. It would just, just be gone, you know? You won't be able to control, your, contain yourself, you know? It just, it's, it's so wonderful. It's so magnificent what he has done. And uh, I'm just saying, Lord, continue to shine your light down into my heart, to my spirit, so I can see and we can comprehend what you've done, what you're doing, you know? See, he's already done it, and what he's doing is revealing what he's done. And see, and as he reveals it, it makes it brand new. It makes it all exciting, all right now. Right, George, you're talking about the people going to the gold rush, you know. Somebody digs and he got it. Well, that might have been five years ago, but somebody else came after and he found some. It was brand new again. It was exciting. That's the way it is with the gospel. There's those that went before us. They got some wonderful things. That was great. I said, man, how great and marvelous. Brother George, man, look at the revelation that, that he had. That's wonderful. I don't know about the revelation that God's going to give me. See, I don't know about what he's got for me, what he opens up to me. We know it's a revelation of Jesus Christ that he showed. Well, you know what I'm saying? You know, yes, he had a great portion. That was wonderful. That's exciting. But then, what about me? You know, you, you, you may have, you know, a, a pocket full of money. Your bank account might be full. But what about me? See, it's great. You might have those things, but 
What about me? See, what am I going to enjoy? See, and sometimes when people have, yes, they will share. That's wonderful. I like to have the resources, <laughs> you know. And Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. And he said, if you'll drink of this water, he said, you'll have wells of living water springing up from within. How could you not? How could you not? You've got the giver of life. You've got life himself, the origin of life living on the inside. No wonder through the faith we've obtained this peace because we have the Prince of Peace on the inside. What a day. What a day. Amen. Let's see if we can sing this together. I see him, I want to see more. I see him, I want it to become more clear. I want to quit looking through these eyes that's been dimmed. These eyes that's been blurred. I want to see clearly. I want to see clearly. Amen. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the cleansing flow, man. My soul from without within, but my Lord goes ahead. Through Him I must read. Oh yes, I want to see.